Good evening. I'm Anna Schleisman. Thanks for joining us here on the Night Report. Now, for weeks, we've talked about the freedom protests in Canada as though they're far away, but they're closer than we think. The convoy made its way to the Pembina Emerson Port of Entry in eastern North Dakota, blocking traffic in protest of the vaccine mandates. Joel Crane spoke with someone on the ground. This is the scene north of the Nechi Port of Entry, where Canadian authorities have diverted traffic from the Emerson Pembina Port of Entry due to the Canadian truckers' protest. Tara Emerson was backed up by the demonstration and talked to Canadian truckers who are involved in the peaceful rally. They just said that they are tired of their government not listening to them and that they really want these mandates to stop and they don't know how else they can get them to listen. Emerson took these photographs when she was stalled at the protest north of the Pembina Emerson port of entry. Despite the frustration, Tara says the atmosphere wasn't one of anger. It was happy, like everybody was happy. They were happy to be there, happy to be united for a cause and happy to help each other out. This is one of several trucker protests that have broken out across Canada. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has asked demonstrators to stop. I can understand frustrations with mandates, but mandates are the way to avoid further restrictions. Protesters near the Emerson Pembina crossing arrived at the border late Wednesday night and haven't said when they plan on leaving. Reporting from Bismarck, I'm Joel Crane for your news leader. Border Patrol agents say they plan to extend the hours of the Neshi port tonight to accommodate the bottleneck caused by this demonstration. Now, there's still much resistance to vaccine mandates here in the U.S. as well. As such requirements make their way through the federal court system, health care workers at facilities that receive Medicare and Medicaid funding are still required to be vaccinated or have a pending or approved exemption by Valentine's Day. Governor Gianforte wrote an open letter to Montana's health care professionals thanking them for their hard work and urging them to do what they need to do ahead of Monday's deadline, while promising to still fight those mandates. We'll have much more on that tomorrow. Now, let's see what weather Henry sh is, shows us in our forecast tomorrow. It was windy but warm today. We topped out at 43 degrees at the Basin Airport. Not enough to set a new record, but still warm enough across town. We did, however, reach the 50s in Dickinson and Bismarck, even Hedinger, making it all the way to 58 degrees. Now, all of that is going to change tonight after a cold front pushes through. Um, it's going to give us colder weather for tomorrow. The wind lingers. Thankfully, no blizzard conditions here, but tonight into tomorrow morning, if you have any plans on traveling to uh, I-29 or the River Valley, um, blizzard conditions likely due to the snow and the strong gusty winds reducing visibility. Our big story here tomorrow is going to be our temperatures um, continuing to fall and hold steady mainly in the single digits and teens across the Williston area. The wind will be out of the north and west a little gusty at times, so those gusts around 30 to 40 are still going to be a thing. Thankfully, this surge of Arctic air is not going to be long term. In fact, we'll be warming back up again by Saturday. Thank you, Henry. Williston City Commissioners voted 3-2 to two this week to create the city's first special assessment district since the 80s. It will cover 61 lots at the Highlands at Hawkeye Village, where the developers are asking the city to help with construction costs. But they must pledge 35% of collateral, which some commissioners felt was too low. But the developing manager says special assessments aren't as risky as they used to be. The deals that are being uh, signed are much more balanced. The developers have more at risk. I, I think they made the right decision, even though it was hard to get there. The development will have 170 homes with space for retail and a new school. Now, more housing is definitely needed as the Williston area continues to grow, especially as it becomes a coveted site for economically and environmentally friendly projects. The latest such project, Wellspring Hydro, which aims to use produced water, the Bach and oil field's largest waste product, and turn it into usable products such as lithium and hydrochloric acid. And it will be right next to facilities that need those products, like the Saralon Gas Liquids Plant and the new Data Processing Center where typically those products were being shipped in from 1,000 to 1,500 miles away, we will be right next door just piping over the product that they need on a daily, daily basis. Kemp says the facility will provide 60 full-time jobs and $60 million in annual revenue.
Now, lithium is about to be in even higher demand as it's used to make electric car batteries. And President Biden just announced a major initiative to ramp up their production and use. The plan includes a new facility in Tennessee that will produce up to 30,000 electric car chargers as part of Biden's larger vision to build a sprawling $5 billion network of charging stations across the country. With reports today that inflation has risen more than 7% in the past year, he partially blames gas-powered cars. One of the reasons automobiles cost so much is they're responsible for one-fifth of the recent inflation is because they lack semiconductors. They're not able to build them quick enough, so the price goes up higher because there's fewer to sell. He and his administration say e-vehicles are the wave of the future, and this plan will offer a major boost to the nation's embattled economy. To help create jobs, fight the climate change crisis, and ensure that this game-changing technology is affordable and accessible for every American. Taking together, an electric future comes uh, into focus, and with it, good-paying jobs, good health, good communities across the nation. We are excited to get it done. Also in Washington, the Senate passed one of the largest workplace reforms in decades. It forbids employers from forcing workers with sexual misconduct claims into arbitration. Instead, the measure permits them to file lawsuits. Right now, about 60 million workers are bound by contractual clauses that prevent them from suing for such claims, which disproportionately impacts low-wage fields and women of color. Now, in the meantime, a group of bipartisan senators, including North Dakota's Kevin Kramer, is advising the Securities and Exchange Commission to require publicly traded companies to disclose whether they have cybersecurity expertise on their board of directors. They say increasing transparency for investors is vital amid soaring economic costs and persistent cybersecurity threats. They wrote in a letter to the SEC, public companies and investment managers should pay attention to threats before they're realized. This is a better approach than scrambling to figure out what went wrong after investors have been harmed. How a company chooses to address cybersecurity risks would remain its own decision. Now, there's also a growing need for cybersecurity professionals. With this in mind, Nevada Senator Jackie Rosen introduced the Cyber Ready Workforce Act. It instructs the Department of Labor to offer grants to schools and businesses that offer apprenticeships. We know that there are important jobs to do because we've seen whether it's in our personal life, if our bank accounts or our personal identity we worry about. We've seen ransomware at schools and in hospitals, uh, critical infrastructure. These are great jobs of the future. CyberSeek.org shows there are nearly 600,000 cybersecurity job openings. Now, students from across North Dakota are getting a first-hand look at what that career looks like. The three-day Cyber Madness event kicked off today with presentations from industry leaders. Organizations say it also supplements what they learn in the classroom. Well, it's one thing to talk about it and the general principles and concepts of those uh, terms and those uh, techniques, but it's also another to actually um, address them, to work in the industry, to work in the field, and see the different opportunities that you can do. Students from Tioga, Wilson, Trinity Christian, and more compete in a tournament starting tomorrow. Now, over the past 10 years, the Department of Public Instruction has placed a strong emphasis on improving conditions for Native American students, of which there are about 13,000 enrolled throughout the state, making up about 10 percent of the entire student population. Ten years ago, the graduation rate among them was 52 percent. As of last year, that rate was up to 78 percent. We believe it's critically important to provide opportunities for all North Dakota students and citizens to learn about Native American culture and history. The DPI says ACT scores among Native American students have increased as well. Well, our country is divided, but can lawmakers save us from ourselves? Find out how they're trying after this. You're watching The Night Report at 10, live on KUMV-TV, your news leader.